Do you find? Right. As a discussion, I, I, I follow three speakers who knew what they're talking about, and it's not, not my job to know anything, but just to sort of muse reflectively on some of the things that we've heard. <laughs> and I promise you I will muse very, very briefly. So let's get rid of the term Build Back Better because basically it's just a strap line and it's an excuse for everyone to go around doing whatever they want but pretending we're doing the same thing. Uh, I agree 100%. However, I think it's a bit... I, I would blame Bill Clinton for quite a lot, but I don't want to blame him. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, seriously, I don't think he's to blame for the fact that agencies wander around all doing completely different things and not knowing what they're talking about because I think that long predates him. So I don't want to blame Bill Back Better. <laughs> I don't blame Build Back Better for the problem because, I, for example, we're now supposed to replace Build Back Better with resilience. And I see exactly the same issues around resilience. It is, yeah, yes, I mean, there's, there's a sense in what we want to do and, ma and making people less vulnerable. I'm not, not against that. But as a sort of strap line to cover, let's all do whatever we want to do. We're, we're, we're broken out of our silos. We've all got the same umbrella. But none of us actually know resilient to what, when, where. So I think... Yeah, let's get rid of the term, but we haven't got rid of the problem by doing so. Um, I think, if we, if, I mean, the, the term is so alive and well even when we don't use the words, because if any of you have sort of read anything about resilience and seen these wonderful graphs where things go down and up, and as soon as the worse things get, the higher the line, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, people are supposed to, you know, now we've, got, we've gone beyond build back, but it's now bounce back better. You know, bounce back better. <laughs> So bounce back better means if you're, if you're kind of stuck in a rut, what you've got to do is kind of have a disaster and then you get rich <laughs> all on your own. Now, <laughs> it's interesting because I think there are two very, very different ideas or two sides of the same idea, one of which makes perfect sense and the other doesn't. And the one that makes an awful lot of sense is let's not recreate the problem. Yeah? We had a problem, let's not recreate it. Let's don't recreate the structural vulnerabilities. And that seems to be great common sense. The other one is kind of less common sense. It's kind of somewhere between biblical and, and Marxist. The idea that in order to have change, we need to destroy what was there before. It's kind of Pol Pot Year Zero stuff. Yeah? <laughs> Noah and the Flood. Yeah? So like kind of, when things get worse, it's an opportunity for things to get better. And that, well, it, for those of you who are Marxist and, 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 and biblical scholars, may, maybe there's a truth in it. But it's not intuitive common sense in the same way. So I think, I think, I think we've got a problem. And I'm struck by your question. You, you said the fundamental question you always want to ask is why. And that's the question I want to ask. Because you, you thank you for that. The question is why? Why should the disaster be an opportunity? Yeah. Let's, if we look at the disasters, what was there in any of the disasters that might make us think that here is an opportunity for things to actually get better than they ever have been in the past? And the reason why I think that's an important question is if we're looking forward, I mean, you know, and, and sort of if we're looking at the Philippines and Central African Republic and Syria and Afghanistan, you, you fill in with your favourite disaster, then we've got to look also there, well, what, what is there an opportunity? Now, we know that sometimes is. I mean, Turkey and Greece, there was an earthquake somewhere and one started giving aid to the other and then I think the other had an earthquake and they, they started talking again. So what was the opportunity? There was a sentimental change, yeah? Because out of human suffering. And that can happen. Yeah? So we can build on that one. Tsunami was very different. It was, it was about money, wasn't it? It was just like this vast outpouring of money that agencies, which was all given and legally had to be spent on emergency relief, because that's kind of the legal contract. And the aid agencies hadn't got a clue what to do with it. There was no way they could spend it. So they kind of got involved and said, oh, well, let's kind of put another story on the house or, or, or whatever it was. So that, that can be a, an opportunity. Um, in Myanmar, actually, the political impasse w was possibly an opportunity. The fact that the Western donors wanted to help but couldn't, and ASEAN said, hey, opportunity for us to get involved. So that's a different kind of opportunity. Um, but I think we are always go back to this idea of the physical clean slate. It's like, you know, the bad building has been destroyed, so I can, you know, I, I can reconstruct it. And that's the one that gives me a lot of problem, even when the physical is metaphorical. <coughs> For those of us who don't believe that the world looks the way it does entirely by chance, yeah, meaning the kind of things are the way they are for a reason, and people like me sort of think that the reason is usually about power and politics and stuff like that. If you kind of follow me a even a little way down that line, then getting rid of the houses means that what's probably going to happen is that the same houses are going to crop up. Because there was a reason why they looked like that before, and unless you change the underlying, whatever you want to call it, then why do we think that anything is going to change in the, in, in the longer term? And if we really want Build Back Better to mean anything at all, 
then we've got to say, well, what is the opportunity of a crisis for, for changing that? And here we have a real paradox, because all the Build Back Better we've spoken about, it's been natural disasters. <laughs> huh? And I don't think that's by chance, because I think that this kind of... The Build Back Better is such an, an apolitical outpouring of, oh, let, you know, whatever. But actually, the natural disasters are the very times when the basic fundamental realities are least likely to have changed. Actually, maybe a slight counterexample, and then you, you know, uh, which can be explained in a, in a very particular way. But if we look around at where, the, you know, the structural political realities really have changed, you think for example of colonial, you know, um, um, anti-colonial war, liberation struggles, and stuff like that. Then you would think, well, now here is the chance for a build back better. And funnily enough, we never heard the term, did we? <laughs> and yet, we had an awful lot of governments who were trying to say, well, we're not going to recreate the colonial mentality or, and, and so on. Or, you know, post apartheid, we, did we ever hear it? And perhaps that means now. So, right, where am I going with this? No idea at all. I'm discussing. I don't, <laughs> I don't have to go anywhere. I'm muse, remember? <laughs> so, <laughs> makes me think that this build back better is possibly an awful lot more. Bit kind of irrelevant to people's lives. If in the real cases where it matters, people don't think it like that. Who thinks like that? Western aid agencies think like that. It's kind of our terminology for what we do. Then we've got the real question, which is whose job is changing the fundamental problems and structural causes of vulnerability, poverty, inequality, and whatever else, you know, at, at your list, gender discrimination, and so on. And it strikes me that sort of the Build Back Better terminology is very much come out of this emergency relief. But why on earth would we imagine that changing long-term realities is actually the job of people who go in for six months to save lives and then get out again as fast as they can? And it seems it's very much like resilience. We've sort of, we, because the job is of resilient is about being better able to cope with a crisis, that we think that the crisis has got something to do with building it. And that seems to be, to me, very, very counterintuitive. And the last thought I will leave you with, because time is, is, is ticking on, is this, is that let's just look at the way we kind of operate. You know, our, our wonderful clusterized world, and we, we've had a little bit of, you know, mention of that already. Um, now, if it's true, and I, you know, I'm not the first person to say this, this has been said, said before, if it's true that kind of really changing and building more resilient communities or really building back better or, or, or whatever it is, really making a change, making people less vulnerable, if that is around institutional change, we've heard the word markets mentioned, say for communities, then it does seem that you can't do that in sitting in a cluster because you've actually got to look at the bigger picture. So then the question is, can we actually build back better or build resilience in a clusterized world? And the answer to that is very, very simple, and I think quite significant. We'll never know, because humanitarian agencies never bother to go back four, five, six, ten years later to find out. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, everyone. I think uh, with the authority of being the chair, I'm, I'm, I'm opening up for questions uh, here and in the virtual. So I'm collecting three at the moment, okay. Can you please just introduce yourself and your affiliation and speak in the mic? Uh, 